Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the Teacher's Point of View podcast. Um, I'm so pleased that you obviously come on. I think with everything that's happening this year, I think yeah, it's quite nice to have somebody on that's really focused on the well-being of staff, you know, and, um, and, and obviously it'd be quite good to get your expertise on why it's that much more important to look after staff this year. Um, you know, like there's obviously a recruitment retention problem in, in the profession anyway, isn't there? And um, ultimately, even more than ever, schools need to be thinking about how they're going to retain their staff. And I think what you're doing is, is a fantastic fantastic project I think obviously looking after your staff is is massive at the moment I mean could you just kind of run through where you're at and sort of your journey into teaching and where you're at now if, if you don't mind yeah absolutely thanks so much for having me today it's great to be here yeah so I started teaching oh my goodness I started teaching in the year 2000 so some time ago now um, and I was an English teacher um, and I started, I, I did my teaching practice in Bradford and then I had, did my first job in a big comprehensive just outside Leeds. Um, and then I taught in different parts of the country because I moved around. My husband was in the army, so we moved around. But so always in secondary schools and I taught English, media studies and was literacy coordinator, but also did some stuff around staff well-being. And then sort of latterly, I retrained as a coach and started to introduce coaching culture and coaching techniques into um, education as well. Um, and I left teaching in July 2019. So it's been just kind of 18 months since I've been out of teaching altogether and now fully focused on coaching. So I've done a, yeah, I've done kind of 18, 18 years in the, in the profession, which I absolutely loved, never imagined I'd do anything else. And then came across coaching and, and I'm very lucky to absolutely love that as well. Yeah, what, what made you make the switch? I know teaching can be a bit of a hard profession, can't it? I mean, did you kind of lose um, sort of passion for the profession or was it something else for you that kind of made you leave? Um, honestly, I thought that I would be in teaching until I retired. And then I came across coaching. I went to do a leadership course and coaching was part of that. I'd never heard of coaching and we started practicing. And the two colleagues that I was working with said, oh, Sarah, do you know what? You're really good at this. And I thought, you know what? I'm really enjoying it. So I kind of planted a seed. And then a little while after that, I thought, I'm just going to kind of find out a little bit more about this coaching thing. And it kind of grew from there, really. So it wasn't for me so much that I wanted to leave teaching as that I really wanted to pursue the coaching. And then for a few years, I ran the coaching business alongside teaching part time. But as you can imagine, it got to a stage where I thought, no, it really has to be one or the other now. Um, and that was what kind of prompted me to leave teaching and to move full time into coaching. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, so let's just talk about what, what you do then. So obviously you're a wellbeing coach, aren't you, in some respects? Like you, you kind of go into schools or in, in corporate companies and kind of like speak about like the importance of looking after your staff. I mean, could you just give a little bit more detail why that's so important? Yeah, absolutely. Because I, in teaching and I work with people in the NHS as well, but, you know, in many different, many different um, roles, business owners, people in corporate, so often we put our well-being to the bottom of the pile. So we do, we fulfill all of our other obligations and responsibilities first. And then we think, oh, well, then I'll fit my well-being in if it fits at the end of the day and of course it doesn't as we know there's always more to do than there is time in which to do it and so what that means is is that we put our well-being to the bottom of the pile but what that means is then that we neglect ourselves we neglect our energy we get sick and what I find with you know working with women who've maybe done that for many many years eventually you kind of get a bit resentful because you've really sacrificed your own needs for everybody else's for such a long time that you start to eventually you start to begrudge that or to become a little bit bitter. Whereas if we can flip that, if we can say, I'm going to make sure, and Michelle Obama talks about this and she talks about it as being scheduling yourself first. I'm going to make sure that my own needs are met first. And I'm not talking about you know, trips to the spa or, or any, you know, I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about the basic needs of, am I getting enough sleep? Am I feeding myself properly? 
Am I getting out for some exercise? Am I making time for my important relationships? Those four things and putting those in as foundations and then doing everything else. Whereas for so many of us, it's the other way around. And I think that's where we start to have difficulty because we get to burn out. Yeah, I, I think with teaching profession in particular, I mean, it's like you, you just look at the profession and a lot of, I mean, statistics show that a lot of teachers will leave within four years of qualifying. And that is probably because they've burned themselves out. I think there is this old fashioned kind of um, understanding or expectation, if, if you like, um, that teachers need to be working until six, seven o'clock doing planning and marking. There's not enough time during the day to do it all. Um, Phil Sharrock is really against that. I don't know if you know Phil is, but he's he very much speaks about you know like if you're not doing it between a certain time what are you doing I mean like are you doing your job properly because you need to go home and you need to have those relationships and even John Tate says it like I think you really need to kind of be organized as as a whole because it is important to have work-life balance you know otherwise like you said you get burnt out and then you you kind of start to resent the profession almost you know absolutely no I absolutely agree with you and I think that you know, teaching is a profession, which is a vocation, isn't it? For the majority of us, we come into it because it's a vocation and we want to serve and we want to give. And therefore, there's a culture that we kind of give and give and give, but without being a culture of recognising that it's so important to take care of ourselves. And anybody who's ever stepped foot inside a school will know that if you, you know, once you offer yourself, they'll, you know, they'll, you'll literally be bitten off at the arm, won't you? You know, whatever you give, it's kind of almost never enough. You know, people just kind of want more and more and more of you. And so what I feel very strongly is that we need to be teaching, particularly our young teachers, about how to manage their energy and how to do the job effectively but not to the detriment of their health, not to the detriment of their well-being. Because otherwise, we do get to a point, either very quickly or even after a long career, where we burn out. And when, you know, we're just no good to anybody. And I just used to say, you know, early on in my career, I was, um, one of my roles was in staff support. So it was, it was, and actually that was very forward thinking in a big comprehensive school. They had, they had a team, there are only two of us in the team, they had a team of two of us dedicated to staff support, to looking after the staff and helping the staff develop. And one of the things that we used to focus on there was staff well-being and one of the things that I learned myself very quickly but also used to teach to other people is that the most important thing is your energy when you show up in the classroom that that matters above anything else because the kids like obviously pick up on that don't they and that matters more than have you got the reports done have you done the marking anything else which is not to say that that stuff isn't important but the first thing that has to happen is that you have to get it right in the classroom before trying to do all of the rest of it yeah absolutely i think it's i, I completely understand what you're saying but it like from a pgc perspective right if, if you're a pgc student i mean mm. you've got coursework assignments you've got to do planning you've got to do you've got to do observations i mean you've got so much on and if you don't get it done because i think with with anything when you do something new for the first time it takes you that much longer to, to kind of understand it don't doesn't it and when you're a pg student you're going to teach them for the first time you've got so much information that you need to take on as well make sure you follow through in the tasks i mean you've obviously mentioned about kind of getting it in from an early like teachers that are early on in their career they that's when we need to be teaching them how to have a work-life balance i mean it's it's almost got to be embedded in part of the learning curriculum of a PGC in some respects, hasn't it? Because you, it's very difficult for PGC students to get everything done. Like what's expected of them, it's very difficult for them to get it done within the, like the times that you're saying. I mean, mm -hmm. how can you, like, I mean, how would we be able to fit that with PGC students' expectations? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think probably, you know, in that PGC year and probably in that first year of teaching as well, there, you know, there is to a certain extent you are going to be working really hard because that learning curve is really steep. And, you know, I remember the first time I planned a lesson, like it literally took me hours, whereas obviously later on in my career, that's something that I could do really quickly. So I think there is a certain, you know, there has to be a certain acceptance, maybe that early on the hard, you know, it is necessary to put that hard work in. But I do also feel that from the beginning, we need to be teaching that yes, okay, we need to show up and we need to work hard, 
but we also need to make sure that we are taking care of our own well-being as well so that we do as much as we can but at the end of the day we say that's enough now I need to make sure I've got enough sleep or that's enough now I need to make sure that I've eaten or whatever those things are so putting it in those kind of you know this I call them the like the pillars of well-being so you're fitting those in alongside obviously what is you know the PGC is no getting away from it it is going to be a demanding year but also recognizing that that year isn't forever and it should be the case that as you go further into your career that things do get quicker things do get easier and that you should really be making time to look after your well-being yeah absolutely um, I think if anything's taught if this year's taught us anything it's the importance of like the what well, appreciating the small things in life yeah. you know I mean I think when, when I started my own company a year ago I, I was in the mindset that I just wanted to grow massively and have all these people working for me but you know like I mean I've, I've spent so much more time with my family my, my parents and you know like I mean it's, it's things that like these little things that you kind of rep- like realize you know what that these are the important things in life and mm. you get so carried away in your career I mean for, ni- for nine years I worked 50 60 hours a week and 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 you know like it's important to have that work-life balance because you do get burnt out and you start resenting the job at times you know and and that's natural and even if you have a natural passion for what you do you kind of get to that stage and I think what you're doing is quite remarkable to try to to make people understand you know what this is the way we're going to retain staff this is the way that we're going to solve this recruitment retention problem is by you know what looking after our staff because even Phil Sharrock, he said 70% of a school's budget goes to staff, like staff wages. So, I mean, ultimately, if that's your biggest investment, why are you not looking after your investment, you know? Um, so I think it's very important. I mean, schools are obviously very tight on budgets usually anyway, aren't they? And, like, I mean, how can they... I mean, it's, it's not that like we expect them to pay more money, but in some respects we do, don't we? Like if they wanted this kind of course or your services to come in and, and obviously work with the well-being, I mean like do they have enough budgets to allocate a top, like money for for obviously services like this with with everything that's going on well yes that's a really good question but yes i feel that it needs to be a priority because we know that when you have staff absence which is you know going to be higher this t- term because of covid and going forwards it costs the school a lot of money when you have when you lose staff and you have to go through the recruitment process again that costs a lot of money whereas when you invest in a well-being project that investment should be a one-off investment that you make, you train your staff around well-being, you put your policies in place around well-being, and you are going to get a return on investment incredibly quickly from that. The other point linked to that, which is interesting, is that the government, quite rightly, in my view, have allocated £8 million pounds of funding to student well-being as a result of COVID. But nobody has yet thought about teacher well-being so where is that given that we have a national crisis in recruitment and retention where is the funding to support teacher well-being in this time you know what that's uh, i mean as you raised quite a good point and it, to be honest with you it frustrates the hell out of me and this is almost why i've created this podcast is because the teachers just aren't appreciated for what they do i mean they, people just kind of like the public see them almost as robots like the government tells them what to do and they go stand in front of 30 kids and and teach but like teachers are humans you know like my sister she's an assistant ed teacher and she hasn't come to her parents house i mean she can pick something up the other night and she literally stood outside for like t- like two three meter distance just because she didn't want to pass anything on to my parents and you know like the teachers are putting their lives at risk every single day being on the front line i mean they could get at any point couldn't they um, and it's frustrating to that the government aren't looking after the profession i get it yeah it's all about kids i do get it but if you don't look after the teachers then how are they meant to look after the kids you know and exactly and this, this is the biggest problem right now isn't it yeah it, no exactly and and also you know the children are watching us so closely and they learn from us what we do so we are modeling for them what health what well-being looks like so f- from my mind there's no point really in kind of giving money to student well-being if the people that are teaching them and leading them aren't modeling the well-being themselves so i think you know if we can invest that in our teachers invest that in our staff and and have them model to the children this is what well-being looks like this is what calm looks like this is what joy looks like and we can't do that when our teachers are exhausted and overworked and and stressed because the kids pick up on that energy and they pick up on that model 
They do. And I think, it's, you know what, again, that's a very good point because I saw something online the other day, actually, and it said something along the lines of uh, some children come into school to learn, some children come in for love. And, you know, like, and it, like teachers, if they feel stressed and feel like uneasy or like they feel tensed, I mean, that's, they're not going to be able to pitch the same quality lesson in class, but give that same level of love and care that, that kids need, you know. And it's, I think it's remarkable. I mean, I personally think that it's more should be done from the government. I don't know about you. But I mean, how, like from your point of view, obviously you're in the profession and um, how difficult has it been for teachers in the last eight months with with keeping the like sort of the well-being as priority in schools? I mean, how difficult has it been for them? I think it's been incredibly difficult because I think the workload because of COVID has increased and the fear obviously around keeping the teachers keeping themselves safe, but also keeping everybody else safe as well and following all of those procedures has been incredibly tough. And I think just the, you know, the relationships as well have suffered because, you know, just due to kind of the dynamics of COVID, the social distancing, you know, we know as teachers how important those informal conversations are in the staff room or having that support of our colleagues and because people are operating in bubbles secondary teachers are having to move from classroom to classroom every lesson it's incredibly tough and we know that the autumn term is incredibly tough anyway I think I read something um a quote from Mary Bolstead who's um the you know in charge of the of the teaching union and she said that the levels of exhaustion that she was seeing in October half term were equivalent to those of the levels of exhaustion that we would usually see at Christmas so people are more exhausted kind of earlier in the term than they would be usually and that rings huge alarm bells for me about teacher well-being because we know how tough it is usually let alone at this time yeah I mean what's the answer like I mean what what do schools need to incorporate into their into their school e Fos almost to to make sure that they are kind of keeping the teacher well-being at sort of the to, sort of at the front of their thoughts you know yeah well I think firstly it is about workloads and I know in I know in schools we talk a lot about reducing teacher workload but that has actually got to happen and you know that has actually got to be acted on so the bureaucracy which is the thing that drives so many teachers mad we've got to identify what is really valuable what needs to stay and actually what is not valuable what needs to go what is unnecessary what is surplus to requirements that needs to go so workload number one and number two is about education about educating teachers that you have the importance of putting your well-being, putting your energy to the top of the list, that would be number two for me. And the third is that the government, if they don't, you know, if they want to avoid an even bigger crisis in recruitment and retention, have got to put some money, they've got to throw some money this way at whether that's reducing teacher workload or you know, putting in well-being strategies so that teachers are better supported because at the moment they're not being they're not being sufficiently well supported, and that is going to impact on our young people. Absolutely. Like, wh where does this decision come from? Like, who makes this decision to to increase teaching well-being or or to reduce the workload? Yeah. Well, exactly. I think. Sadly, it may not come until there really is a tipping point, until, you know, until the issue around recruitment and retention becomes such that, that they are forced to do something about it. And I think what Rebecca and I are sort of saying through the Teacher Wellbeing Project is let's not leave this until the bottom of the pile. We recognise this is super important. And ultimately, it's, you know, the kids are not going to get what they need until the teachers are OK. You know, and what that's what we really want to see is to see happy, healthy, thriving teachers. But this needs time, it needs focus, and it's going to need money. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think with any any head teacher would probably tell you like budget's been a bit tight, especially this year because of everything that's happening. I mean, I've spoken to a couple of senior leaders and they've said that they've been short on laptops and you know, like they've got so many priorities at the moment. And unfortunately, teacher wellbeing is right at the bottom of the pile, isn't it? And you're absolutely right, until things hit that breaking point, there probably won't be a difference. I mean, who who has the power to make that decision? Is it Gavin Williamson? <laughs> yeah, well you would hope so. You would hope so, but I think that you really have to First of all, have a, have a real understanding and regard for the teaching profession, which is 
takes us back to the beginning of the conversation. It's about having that respect for the job that teachers do and recognizing how tough it is and how many expectations there are. Um, but I don't think it's going to come from Gavin Williamson, which is why, you know, it's people like me and Rebecca who have retrained as coaches and we've got, you know, we've got skills in supporting people in, in many different contexts and professions around well-being who also have that knowledge of what it's like to be a teacher, what it's like to be in the classroom, because I can't see it coming from within education either, just because people are so overstretched. It almost takes, you know, people like me and Rebecca who've been in, but now are out and can kind of see from a slightly detached perspective what's going on to actually say, listen, there's got to be a drive for change here. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's so difficult, isn't it? Because you're right, everyone in education is kind of stretched. But we go back to Gavin Williamson. I mean, he's been absent for the last year. I mean, I genuinely haven't seen anything from him whatsoever that is contributed to the welfare of education in any way. Um, and we were talking, I mean, I've had so many conversations about this, but a, a usual lifespan of a Secretary for Education is 18 months to a, or, or to two years, isn't it? And I mean, how really can you get into that role? Like, promise certain things and then fulfill that by the end of your reign like it's, it's not going to happen and like, I mean my view and, and I think some of the senior leaders views across the country is to have one union where like or, or at least an educator that's the secretary for education that actually understands the industry I mean it's such a difficult one because yeah the, the, the focus should be on well-being and recruitment should be like a little bit better because there should be more money in it but I mean, the government just isn't doing it. You know, I mean, we're not getting that support as a, well, you're not getting that support as a profession from, from the government. I mean, like we, we've everything that's happening and the, the lack of support from the government. What, what can schools do like as a starting point to, to focus on teacher wellbeing that is going to be within their kind of budget range? Well, I think the first thing is to identify what's important and what really makes the difference. So as I said earlier, you know, how we show up in the classrooms and our relationship with the students, for me, is the thing that really makes the difference. And then looking at the workload, thinking, OK, what really matters and what actually can we reduce here? And then changing that school culture so that you break away from that culture of, well, I'm, you know, I'm a better teacher because I've worked more hours to actually I'm a better teacher because I've looked after myself. I've looked after my energy and therefore I can have greater impact that way. And accepting that although as teachers, you know, we all like to do things to a high standard. The fact is the reality of the job is you can't do everything. And that sometimes you have to accept that good is good enough and that's OK and move on. And I think the more we can, you know, not to kind of drop standards or to lower standards. Standards, but the more that we can, you know, teach teachers to focus on the things that really matter and to focus less perhaps on a lot of those kind of bureaucratic exercises that, that we are instructed to do, the better. Yeah, I mean, again, it comes from like the above, doesn't it? People that aren't really in education. I mean... <laughs> It's a really difficult one because obviously there's only so much schools can do and there's so much support head teachers and, and senior leaders across the country get, you know. I mean, like if from a government perspective, like what, what could they do? Like what, what it being in the profession, like what would you want from them as your employer? Well, you know, I mean, we've, this, we've been talking about this for years, haven't we? But giving teachers the freedom to teach in the way that they know to be best for the children stripping away lots of the reporting and the bureaucracy which doesn't really add value identifying what does add value but the stuff that doesn't reducing that and ultimately what i would like to see is i'd like to see increased funding in teacher well-being so whether that means reducing teacher workload in whatever way giving teachers more time for ppa whatever that whatever that stuff is allowing teachers to have a bit more bit more scope a bit more breathing space yeah absolutely it's, it's a difficult one isn't it i mean it's, it's such a hard it's such a difficult year and you know like this year i felt like the the teaching profession hasn't been valued for, for what they've done because we, we've i mean obviously at the beginning of this podcast we've mentioned that they've been risking their lives every day and going in the front line and making sacrifices with loved ones just because they don't want to pass on covid and it's mm -hmm. it's really difficult when obviously you're you're working so hard doing so much for this country when everybody else is in lockdown and mm -hmm. then 
obviously we don't get the right level of support that we need from mm-hmm. obviously the people in charge, you know, and, and, and often like the Secretary for Education doesn't really know how it is to be a teacher and kind of t- like telling you what to do. And I mean, it's, it's a hard one for teachers at the moment because it, I mean, some of them are starting to question why they're in teaching if they don't get that val- sort of, if they're not valued and if they're not appreciated. And it's, again, it comes back to that and to teacher wellbeing. It's so important for retention to, mm-hmm. to focus on this, isn't it? I mean, you've obviously um, just going on to something that I've saw on your profile, you kind of, are focused on quite a lot of um, women well mm. within mm. the profession. I mean, why, why specifically women? Like, talk to me about that. Well, um, because when I went back, to, I've had three children and I went back from maternity leave to three different schools because, as I mentioned, my husband was in the army, so we moved around quite a lot. And each time I went back after maternity leave, I was really shocked by the lack of support for women returning from maternity leave. Um, and I <laughs> feel that the teaching profession more than any other profession, should be getting right that support of women in the workplace. And secondly, I went from a position where I, you know, had responsibility um, in, you know, in the school that I was working in. And after my first child, I went back and worked as a main main scale class teacher and worked part time. And the difference in the way that I was perceived um, as a teacher then really really shocked me you know it was there was almost a perception that if you're part-time and if you're a teacher that doesn't have responsibility because you've just had a baby then somehow you're not the same teacher that you that you were before and that really that attitude really took me by surprise and I don't think I would have believed it until I experienced it myself and so then as a mother of three I have just been you know been really passionate about supporting women who have had children and women who haven't had children but supporting women who have had children and thinking okay how can we get the best from these women rather than you know almost almost kind of um disadvantaging them because they've chosen to have children i mean the irony is not lost is it we're in the education profession this is all about children so how can we make that better for women and that's really where that's come from yeah, fair enough. I think it's a weird one, isn't it? I mean, like, talk me through what, what you felt. I mean, what was different about when you came back from your maternity? Um, I think, firstly, the way that I was perceived. So I remember I moved, because my husband was in the army, I'd, I moved into a new job and went back part-time. And the first time I was observed, the, the guy observing me went, oh, he went, you're actually a really good teacher. <laughs> <laughs> which kind of really made me laugh because I was like well clearly your assumption was that I was going to be rubbish because I'm a mum and I'm working part-time therefore <laughs> somehow I've lost the ability to teach so that it was that kind of thing that kind of slip away comment that made me think gosh that's really interesting and then the other kind you know the other things would be around I remember one time I had to leave work at 5 p.m because I had to get back for nursery pickup or whatever it was and there was another woman there who hadn't yet had children who really kicked off because I couldn't have a meeting with her at 5 p.m even though I'd given her plenty of notice that I wouldn't be able to have a meeting at 5 p.m that day and I thought gosh you know there's a real lack of understanding of not just mums but parents or anybody who's got caring responsibilities in the workplace that people have a life and it's okay to have a life and to have responsibilities particularly after 5 p.m and again it just made me think if we're not getting this right in education how on earth are we going to get this right in the rest of society yeah it's it's, it's difficult though isn't it i mean if you're obviously like when, when i speak to head teachers obviously i do recruitment and what they're looking for is people that are passionate i really want to make a difference and it's a long-term career for them and you know those kind of things i mean it's it almost like you've got to be human as well, haven't you? I mean, you've got to like understand that these people have their own lives and, you know, like they, they, they're allowed to have their own lives. It doesn't make you a bad teacher if like it's not your absolute first priority to, to not be a teacher. You know, like I know, I understand that obviously the kids come first, but ultimately we've discussed this many times in this podcast, but it's, it's about staff well-being as well, isn't it? And, and only if you look after yourself can you look after anybody else, right? So you've got to be number one priority. And it's so much more important with everything that's happened this year, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, and I've worked with some absolutely brilliant leaders as well, but there's always kind of an understanding there of give and take that you know that your staff will give you so much, so much dedication, 
stay late where it's required but sometimes there has to be a little bit of give as well in that sometimes we need a bit of flexibility because we need to pick our children up or sometimes people have just returned from maternity leave and just might need you know a little bit of time to go are you you know are you okay that was the thing I think that struck me after having had three children that nobody at any point said are you okay you know you kind of like you're expected to walk back in almost pretend you haven't had a baby and carry on and that for me isn't good enough you know that kind of lack of regard for people's well-being is something that I feel that we could be doing a lot better and, and if we don't get this right, I mean, if we don't start making a change now, what do you think the future of education will look like in schools? Well, gosh, you know, I dread to think because when I think about our young people and the, and the generation coming up and the huge challenges that they have to face, largely as a result of what we have created, right? So in terms of, in terms of politics, in terms of issues like climate change, in terms of issues around Black Lives Matter, you know, all of those big issues that we have in society that we need, desperately need to address. Our young people really need really strong, positive role models. And if, and they don't always have those, let's be honest, they don't always have those strong, positive role models at home. For a lot of our young people, where they get their role models is in school. And the people that nurture them and encourage them are the people that they come across in school. Well, if those people, those role models, are not on their A game, are not doing okay themselves, how on earth are we going to inspire and encourage our young people to meet those enormous challenges that are facing them? that's why I really care about it yes I do care deeply about teachers having been one myself and coming from a family of teachers but when it's really what gets me is when I look at the next generation and think what legacy are we leaving for them you know what are we modeling for them that is going to give them the skills that they're going to need to face these huge challenges yeah I mean do you think it's going to be that much more difficult to retain teachers within the industry and and like what kind of time scale do you think we're looking at like if we don't get this sort of right now we don't start making a change now I mean when, when will we start seeing these negative results come into intuition well I think you know we do need to make a change now it does need to be now we knew before covid that we had a huge mental health crisis around um, among our young people and that needs addressing and it's and that's going to have been exacerbated by covid so we need staff who are resilient and nurturing and able to go the extra mile and do all of those things that our young people need but that isn't going to be happen it's not going to happen if they're overstretched tired you know lacking lacking resilience themselves because of an unreasonable workload yeah no absolutely i think it's so important with everything that's going on i mean uh it's just i, I just you know what it's, it's so difficult sometimes because I mean, I, like, I only launched my own company last year, but I wish there was so much more we could do as a community. I mean, I feel so powerless sometimes that we're, we're kind of sat here and we're obviously having a conversation and we're trying to make a difference. But I mean, there's only so much we can do, you know. I mean, there's so many kids out there that are in, from disadvantaged backgrounds and that are the only hot meal in a day is at lunch. I mean, <clears throat> we talk about staff wellbeing, but you see these kids and like you almost have a moral obligation to want to make a difference to them and like you, you've got to go home and be able to switch off you know but i mean i'm sure some teachers care so much about their kids that they they, they feel like morally obliged I, I mean they feel bad about maybe getting a costa coffee like Dee conlon said in, in her podcast you know and um it, it's quite it's quite remarkable and even like we, we must teach teachers that it is, you'd have to go home and switch off because mm. you know, they'll drive themselves insane and i think it's quite remarkable what you're doing actually i mean like for anyone that's kind of looking to get into teaching or that uh, wants to want or that is doing a PC at the moment. I mean, like what, what advice would you give them? I would say absolutely a hundred percent go for it because teaching is a vocation and it's, you know, it is the, it really is like the best job in the world. It is such a privilege to be a teacher and such a great opportunity. However, you have to go into it knowing that you are going to have to put boundaries in place to protect your health and your well-being because people won't necessarily do that for you. Yeah, I mean, some some head teachers will kind of resent that, won't they? I mean, some some head teachers will say, "No, we will." I mean, I expect it done. I mean, whatever you need to do, you need to do it. But what would you say to them? What I would say to them is, you need to focus on what's the most important thing that I need to do, and where can I put boundaries in place 
So where is good good enough? You know, and we and we and it takes to be fair, it takes time and experience, and that's why new teachers need good mentors to help them with that. But yeah, it's about putting boundaries in place, and we are you know we're each responsible for the boundaries that we put in place. Yeah, for sure. I mean, some people that experience in their career, though, like it's so hard to try to teach them a new way of doing things because they're always set in their ways, aren't they? And if you've got a head teacher that's been doing it for 20, 30 years and they're like, well, I didn't have to focus on this in my career. Like, why do you have to focus on it in your career? I mean, why is it that much more important in, in this generation that we, we adapt to the times and, and focus on teacher well-being more than it so in 20 years ago? Because the workload has increased, hasn't it? We know that the workload has increased astronomically which is why it's becoming increasingly harder to retain teachers and I think that I find it hard to imagine that there are head teachers out there now who don't recognize that well-being is important just even if it's just in terms of retaining staff even if it's for no other reason than that yeah for sure um oh yeah sorry I lost you there for a second but yeah it's so when you're obviously pitching these to these head teachers about teacher well-being, I mean, what, what kind of objections do you usually face? Well, the usual objections of time. I haven't got time for this. It's not top of our agenda. We've got to have staff meetings about other stuff and money. But, you know, those objections of time and money, if you don't make the time and money for it, it's going to cost you a lot more time, i.e. staff absence, and a lot more money, i.e. staff absence, further down the line. Yeah, it's it's crazy, isn't it? Fair enough. I mean, like obviously you've given great advice to anyone that's looking to get into teaching. I mean, you've given us quite a lot of information, and I think what you're doing is remarkable. I mean, it, do you have anything else that you really want to add and and sort of speak about before we kind of finish it off? I think when you think, you know, I've kind of alluded to this earlier, but I think about when you think about looking after yourself and you think about your self-care, you know, I was talking about the idea that self-care is not selfish. And often we would do stuff for other people that we won't necessarily do for ourselves. So when you think about managing your well-being, you're not just thinking about yourself. You're thinking about, okay, if I manage my well-being and my energy, what are the benefits going to be to the people around me? What will the benefits be to my family? what will they be to my colleagues what will they be to the children that I teach and that's the reason well-being is really important so it's not about being selfish it's about looking after ourselves so that we are in a stronger position to serve absolutely and just going back to if you don't look after yourself you can't look after anybody else can you and obviously if you've got 30 kids in front of you you need to be pumped up you need to be revitalized you need to be fresh for that class to be able to deliver it properly to get your kids because teaching it's not teaching 30 kids you're teaching 30 individuals aren't you you're literally you've got to understand them you've got to be empathetic towards them and manage them in different ways and sit, like know what makes them click and it, you've got to be on form you know and um, if you get into Friday Friday afternoon and you're struggling through that last class and you're not able to give those kids what you want to give them is because you're, you're not looking after yourself and, and I think it's so important I think not just in teaching but every every company really needs to have that you know in, in some respects because you will burn yourself out and you will lose your staff because you're not looking after them you know and I think what you're doing is remarkable Sarah I think I think you're onto something there and, and you know what I hope schools kind of look at you and think you know what it's so important this is all right, we're not getting support from the government but what we, what we can do is try to do the best we can because ultimately it's our staff that we need to look after you know and yeah I hope people look at this and think you know what uh, let's get Sarah in because I mean what you're doing is really good so yeah fingers crossed for you Sarah I think what you're doing is really good and um, yeah hopefully it works out for you but um, I think I think the message is very important you know teacher well-being is, is super important at the moment and we're everything that's gone on this year I just hope I just hope like head teachers and senior leaders really take it on them to to make sure they look after their staff you know absolutely thank you so much for having me yeah and I, I you know it is this is not a luxury this is now a necessity so I really hope that people take this on board so if you want to connect with me and Rebecca we are on Facebook and on LinkedIn at the teacher well-being project and we also have a website as well the teacher well-being project um, so any questions we've got a lovely community as well lovely facebook community um, and any questions that you have for us we're very happy to answer um, and we've got a free webinar coming up as well on monday the 30th of november at 4 p.m where we will be giving some tips and some teaching about how you can start to look after yourselves and staff well-being right now because it's so much needed.
Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you, Sarah, for coming on. Um, and, uh, yeah, no worries. Have a good day. Thank you, too.